Hi guys, this is Andrew with headphones.com. Today we're gonna to take a look at the Timsock TS1024 planar magnetic over ear open back headphone that comes in right at around $2,000. We're gonna find out in this video if Tim's socks are gonna knock your socks off or if it's gonna Tim suck. Let's check it out. <laughs> All right, so before getting into the review, I'm gonna give a quick disclaimer here. Uh, this unit was sent over by Lin Sol for evaluation, but I've not been paid to say anything in particular about it, and all thoughts and opinions are my own. With that out of the way, let's begin by talking about the build, design, comfort, aesthetics, and all that stuff. You guys know how it goes. Uh, and I actually gotta say, I gotta start with the accessories here because this comes with this amazing box. Holy smokes, this box is Fantastic. I'm just gonna put it here so you guys can see that. Um, and this is like possibly one of the best uh, packaged headphones that I've ever come across. Like this is all leather on here. Sorry, vegans. Uh, and then when you open it up, it comes with this uh, this baggy o stuff. I'm just gonna close this up again. Inside the baggy o stuff, you get the cable, and then you get a number of different attachments here. And I'll show you what's going on here. Let me just take these out. So the cable. Let's just start with that. Um, it's a little on the stiff side, but it does feel and look quite nice. So, you know, it might not be ergonomically excellent, but the quality does feel quite good here. Um, and it also, I, I like the look of it. Um, it has sort of this, this braided copper kind of look, uh, which is pretty cool. And then you get a Pentacon termination. Now, uh, they've given you a number of different adapters here. This one is uh, XLR. And of course, the Pentacon is balanced as well, and then it just pops on like that. And then you have, uh, you can use it with, you know, whatever outputs you have. And they've also included here uh, 2.5 millimeter balanced. And then they've also included uh, regular 3.5 millimeter single-ended. So if you have a single-ended amplifier, you would just use this and then you would pop a uh, quarter inch adapter onto it as well. So I'm, I'm gonna get all this out of the way now. We'll talk about the headphones. So when it comes to the Timsock TS1024, I'm just gonna call it the Timsock uh, from here on out. You have a headphone that has in my opinion, excellent build quality. Like this all feels really well built and really sturdy. It's a little bit on the heavy side. And if you're thinking about, you know, other planar magnetic headphones, like the full size Odysseys, um, you know, you're, you're not gonna be too thrown off by this. So it's not too bad on the weight, um, but it is something that I notice uh, on top here, even though this uses somewhat of a suspension style system, there's not a lot of give here. So when I put it on, which I'll do here, for some reason you guys love it when I put headphones on. <laughs> you can see how they look, right? You can see the purple or maroon color. I, I'm going with purple here. This is something for Tyler. Um, unfortunately, the pads are also uh, a little bit awkward because I almost think they should have gone with a different pad design for this. Now, what's going on here is you get Velcro pads with um, a little bit of, of material taken out at the top. And that means that it doesn't press into your temples, which is nice, but it never is you know, truly as you know, comfortable and flush as I think it could be. And that's also gonna be an issue when we get to the sound quality and the design of this headphone in general, um, because it, it definitely, the fact that it's using Velcro pads, it might seem like it's a good idea, but it definitely incurs some issues as far as the sound quality is concerned, um, especially when considering how it's worn on the head. For the headband piece, you do get some sliding action going on here where the strap um, is, a little, is adjustable here and it is quite stiff, but that also means that it does retain sort of the spot that you put it in. So that's kind of nice. Uh, and then, you know, you get some leather uh, on the top and the bottom of this, of the top headband piece as well. So this is not a headphone for vegans. If, if you're vegan, like, <laughs> you'd be mad about this. Um, one other issue that I have with the pads is that when you take them off, you take, take the Velcro off. What I found is that the sound does change a little bit depending on kind of the angle of the pad and how it's positioned back onto the headphone. Um, so that means that, you know, you might want to actually play around with this a little bit, but at the same time, you got to make sure that when you are placing it back on, that you've got the angle kind of the same as what you have on the other side. So that way you're not getting some channel imbalance because I, you know, I did actually measure quite a bit of channel imbalance when I was doing my measurements of this, but then I realized that it's probably just because of the, the pads 
you know, not being exactly the same uh, for their angle, and so I had to reposition them. Now, with all that out of the way, let's talk about the sound quality, and we'll begin with the objective stuff, uh, the measurements and frequency response. Uh, once again, if you're totally new to reading frequency response, I've done a whole video on how you can read this stuff, but just keep in mind that the target here is not the only indicator for good sound. This is just a known data point, and it's a known reference point. I have to say that in every video, because I think people think that, you know, as soon as it deviates from the target, then that's bad, but, you know, there are times where it actually should deviate from the target, specifically around 9K, and then there are also times when it's okay that it does. So the target here, it's just, that's our reference point, and that's really why it's important to use this. You know, if you didn't have a reference point there, it, it would be kind of pointless to show the measurements in the first place, so that's really what's going on here. So what I'm showing you guys here is what I expect to be the default frequency response of this headphone, and I'm saying it that way because, again, you know, depending on the angle of the pads, you could end up with a different result. But when you look at the frequency response here, you're going to notice a few things. In particular, the bass here does look like it drops off a little bit. Now, what's going on here is actually on the rig, when I, when I measured this, the default position on the rig doesn't actually show any sub-bass response. Like, it drops off at around, like, 80, 90 hertz almost immediately, like just a completely sharp drop off there. Interestingly, when I did the on-head measurement, which I do with in-ear microphones, I found that on my head I got a little bit more bass response, but not, uh, still, it still dropped off in the, you know, sub-bass, in the ultra-low end in the sub-bass. And so, you know, this default sort of tapering frequency response that I'm showing you here is with a little bit of extra clamp pressure applied, and so, you know, I think depending on how large your head is or how strong the clamp is, uh, that's going to determine how much sub bass you get there. Normally, when you see that kind of drop off in a planar magnetic headphone, that's pretty close to where the resonance frequency of the driver is, and you typically see a boost, some sort of elevation there, um, you know, some peak there, you know, usually uh, between 100 and 150 hertz, somewhere, somewhere around there. And the resonance frequency on this headphone is probably around there as well. But this driver has significant damping on it, such that the resonance frequency actually doesn't show up. You know, when, when I measured this in free air, I was sort of expecting there to be a driver resonance, and it was like, wait, what's, what is going on here? There's, there's nothing. It just, <laughs> it just tapers off completely. Now, this gets a little bit into the weeds here, but essentially what's going on is that the driver damping is making it so that the resonance frequency that would normally be there on a planar magnetic headphone like this one uh, is is just sort of smoothed out quite a bit more, and so rather than seeing a peak there in the base when you um, you know introduce an air gap or measure it in free air, uh, you you don't see that. You see a very very slight kind of plateau almost, and then that same drop off shows up that would always show up you know um, right after the resonance frequency. Now normally in a planar magnetic headphone where you have a resonance frequency that's you know somewhere above 100 hertz like this one you would then use the pads to, you know, make sure it's coupled to the side of the head, and then that would make sure that, you know, you get full bass extension all the way down into the sub bass. You see this on the Hi-Fi Man planers, you see this to a certain degree on the Odyssey planers, and even more extreme examples are, you know, some of the DCA headphones that have really high driver resonance, and what they do is they use adhesive pads, and that gives you sort of the bass extension there. So a lot of the bass tuning there is done with coupling to the side of the head. You make sure that the, there's no leaks or, you know, it's basically sealed here, um, you know, on the front side to the side of the head, and that means that you're going to get the full bass extension there. Now with this headphone, because it's using these Velcro pads, which are porous, you're never, you're never going to get exactly the perfect seal, or it's going to be quite difficult to get exactly a perfect seal, and then on top of it, you're not actually going to get the bass boost that would normally show up because of the driver resonance when the seal is broken here. So that's really why you see this kind of tapering off, drop off in the bass with this headphone. Now, this is all super nerdy stuff and it doesn't really mean anything to people who don't care about that side of things, but um, the effect here is that, yeah, you basically lose out on sub bass and that's, again, partially due to the driver and then also partially due to the pads, the, the pad style. But then the other interesting thing about this headphones tuning is the way that it achieves some sense of uh, warmth in general, you know, right at around like 250, you know, 200, 250 hertz, is it kind of like subdues the upper mids a little bit and that makes a certain amount of sense actually because 
you you wouldn't otherwise be able to get that kind of lower mid and upper bass uh, emphasis with a planar magnetic headphone like this. So you know, if you look at the target there, if you normalize it actually for ear gain, uh, then you have you know pretty substantial elevation there for you know lower mids and upper bass. So it's it's quite warm if you if you look at it that way. It, it makes a certain amount of sense even though it's maybe not ideal. The other key thing here is that it definitely has a strong sibilance peak there um, in in the treble. And this makes it have that sort of like sharpness and uh, kind of spice, treble spice, I like to call it. Um, at, yeah, between like 6 and 8K. So it's, it's a little bit on the sibilant side for sure. Overall, this is not great, but it's, it's also not terrible either. Um, and, you know, apart from that sibilance, I actually think this is okay for the tuning. Uh, it's, it's not something that would be all that difficult to EQ. You'd mainly just drop that sibilance peak there and then give it a sub-bass shelf. And something like that would work out okay. Maybe drop like 250, yeah, 200, 250 hertz a little bit to make that shelf a little more distinct. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at kind of the overall frequency response, it makes sense why they tuned this the way that they did. Even though I don't think that it, it's as competitive as it should be at the asking price. In some ways, it's just, you know, that's, it's a design choice that then leads to certain tuning concessions. It's kind of how I see it. In any case, let's talk about the technical performance or the subjective stuff and all the rest of that. And remember how I mentioned that the driver here is particularly damped so that it kind of smooths out the bass resonance frequency that planners have? Well, surprisingly, this doesn't actually sound blunted for its micro detail and micro dynamics. Um, it's not that crazy for that. I've definitely been spoiled by the HE6, so it's not on that level. Uh, in fact, it's also not on the level of the LCD-X, but uh, this is definitely better than a lot of the lower end planars out there. But again, I think the issue is that this is coming in at $2,000. And it's better the fact that it's pretty good for sort of the immediacy of the initial leading edge, that sort of quickness and tightness quality that I actually really like about planars. And it's also pretty good uh, for its, its micro detail and sort of the clarity for trailing ends of tones. Um, it's good for separation, not the most spacious for its presentation overall. It's not a particularly large or wide soundstage, but it's also not bad either. Uh, it's not super claustrophobic. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's decent across most categories there for me. It's just not $2,000 decent, right? And again, I think I've been spoiled by the Hi-Fi Man HE6, the original there, um, to, you know, recognize that that headphone came out at like $1,300 and then to see this come out at $2,000, it's like, well, this isn't, this is not actually all that close to it. And then thinking again about other headphones that have come out around this price or less, you got the Hi-Fi Man Aria out there, which is better for its frequency response, and then also more spacious presentation and it has more depth and layering to it. And then you also have the Odyssey LCD X, which same thing, uh, it's a totally different kind of flavor, but like, the technical performance there for its detail is still a little better. And this doesn't really do anything to kind of set itself apart from other headphones around this price. Uh, and remember that those other ones come in at less, uh, at a lower price. And then of course, when it comes to macro contrast and macro dynamics in the sense of punch and slam, uh, this again, doesn't really have much going on for that either. Um, not, not terrible, but also not great. And really, I think that's going to be how I see this headphone. Uh, it's really not bad, um, just it, it's a little too sharp there in the treble for me overall. You know, you can EQ this and I, you know, I do recommend doing that because it's not that difficult to EQ. And uh, when you do, it actually sounds pretty good, I think, but it still retains some of those, uh, that sort of planar characteristic about it. So if you're put off by that, then I would look elsewhere. But uh, my conclusion to this headphone is that this is uh, good, but just not good for the price. You know, if this were priced at around $700, uh, I would actually recommend this. I think it would be solid for the price there. It's just not as good as I think it could have been or should have been at this price. And what I wonder here is if they hadn't done the driver damping, what would the results have been, you know, as far as the technical performance? As it is, I have, I guess, some constructive feedback here for Tim Sock, uh, which is a great brand name. It's that I think if they'd gone with a design that didn't require the Velcro pads, if they'd gone with an adhesive style or something that if maybe there's a little bit more clamp force going on here, that would push the, the the cups a little bit closer to the ear and then you know make sure that that seal was consistent, then you'd see that bass response uh, you know all the way down the way you want. Uh, and then also the driver damping here, I don't know I don't know if it's necessary, 
again, to me, this feels like it was a design trade-off that they ended up going with because of other decisions that may not have been necessary. Maybe it's worth kind of iterating on this driver a little bit or, you know, the implementation of this driver because it's definitely still detailed here and it does achieve a reasonable frequency response. But then, you know, it, it needs to be, I think, targeting a different price point still uh, because it's just, uh, it doesn't quite live up to the $2,000 asking price in my opinion. Anyways, that's going to do it for this review. Um, stay tuned for more uh, planar magnetic videos in the future. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the technical aspects in uh, some upcoming videos uh, because we're trying to, uh, I guess, do a little bit more educational content on how planars work. But uh, that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for taking the time to watch it and I'm going to see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.